Chapter Seventeen of North and South by Elizabeth Gaskell. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Read by Marianne. Chapter Seventeen. What is a strike? There are briars besetting every path, which call for patient care, and there is a cross in every lot, and an earnest need for prayer. Anonymous. Margaret went out heavily and unwillingly enough. But the length of a street, yes, the air of a Milton street, cheered her young blood before she reached her first turning. Her step grew lighter, her lip redder. She began to take notice, instead of having her thoughts turned so exclusively inward. She saw unusual loiterers in the street, men with their hands in their pockets sauntering along, loud laughing and loud-spoken girls clustered together, apparently excited to high spirits, and a boisterous independence of temper and behavior. The more ill-looking of the men, the discreditable minority, hung about on the steps of the beer-houses and gin-shops, smoking and commenting pretty freely on every passer-by. Margaret disliked the prospect of the long walk through these streets, before she came to the fields which she had planned to reach. Instead, she would go and see Bessie Higgins, it would not be so refreshing as a quiet country walk, but still it would perhaps be doing the kinder thing. Nicholas Higgins was sitting by the fire smoking as she went in. Bessie was rocking herself on the other side. Nicholas took the pipe out of his mouth, and standing up, pushed his chair towards Margaret. He leant against the chimney-piece in a lounging attitude, while she asked Bessie how she was who's rather run down in the mouth regard to spirits, but who's better in health? Who doesn't like this strike? Who's a deal too much set on peace and quietness at any price? This is the third strike I've seen, said she, sighing, as if that was answer and explanation enough. Well, third time pays for all. See if we don't dang the masters this time. See if they don't come and beg us to come back, at our own price. That's all. We've missed it aforetime, I grant you, but this time we lay our plans desperate deep. Why do you strike? asked Margaret. Striking is leaving off work till you get your own rate of wages, is it not? You must not wonder at my ignorance. Where I come from I never heard of a strike. I wish I were there, said Bessie, wearily but it's not for me to get sick and tired of strikes. This is the last I'll see. Before it's ended, I shall be in the great city, the holy Jerusalem. Who's so full of the life to come, who cannot think of the present? Now I, you see, am bound to do the best I can here. I think a bird in the hand is worth two in the bush, so them's the different views we take on the strike question. But, said Margaret, if the people struck, as you call it, where I come from, as they are mostly all field labourers, the seed would not be sown, the hay got in, the corn reaped. Well, said he, he had resumed his pipe, and put his well in the form of an interrogation. Why, she went on, what would become of the farmers? He puffed away. I reckon they'd either have to give up their farms, or to give a fair rate of wage. Suppose they could not, or would not do the last. They could not give up their farms all in a minute, however much they might like to do so. But they would have no hay, no corn to sell that year, and where would the money come from to pay the laborers' wages the next? Still puffing away. At last, he said, I know not of your ways down south. I have heard there are a pack of spiritless, downtrodden men, wheely clemmed to death too much dazed with clemen to know when they're put upon. Now, it's not so here. We known when we're put upon, and ween too much blood in us to stand it. We just take our hands from our looms, and say, You may clem us, but you'll not put upon us, my masters, and be danged to em, they shan't this time. I wish I lived down south, said Bessie. There's a great deal to bear there, said Margaret. There are sorrows to bear everywhere. There is very hard bodily labor to be gone through, with very little food to give strength. 
but it's out of doors said bessie and away from the endless endless noise and sicken in heat it's sometimes in heavy rain and sometimes in bitter cold a young person can stand it but an old man gets racked with rheumatism and bent and withered before his time yet he must work on the same or else go to the workhouse i thought you were so taken with the ways of the south country so i am said margaret smiling a little as she found herself thus caught i only mean bessie there's good and bad in everything in this world and as you felt the bad up here i thought it was fair you should know the bad down there and you say they never strike down there asked nicholas abruptly no said margaret i think they have too much sense and i think replied he dashing the ashes out of his pipe with so much vehemence that it broke it's not that they've too much sense but that they've too little spirit oh father said bessie what have you gained by striking think of that first strike when mother died how we all had to clem you the worst of all and yet many a one went in every week at the same wage till all were gone in that there was work for and some went beggars all their lives at after ay said he that their strike was badly managed folk got into the management of it as were either fools or not true men you'll see it'll be different this time but all this time you've not told me what you're striking for said margaret again why you see there's five or six masters who have set themselves again paying the wages they've been paying these two years past and flourishing upon and getting richer upon and now they've come to us and say we're to take less and we won't we'll just clem them to death first and see who'll work for em then they'll have killed the goose that laid em the golden eggs i reckon and so you plan dying in order to be revenged upon them no said he i do not i just look forward to the chance of dying at my post sooner than yield that's what folks call fine and honourable in a soldier and why not in a poor weaver chap but said margaret a soldier dies in the cause of the nation in the cause of others he laughed grimly my lass said he you're but a young wench and don't you think i can keep three people that's bessie mary and me on sixteen shillings a week don't you think it's for myself i'm striking work at this time it's just as much in the cause of others as yon soldier only may happen the cause he dies for is just that of somebody he's never clapped eyes on nor heerd on all his born days while i take up john boucher's case as lives next door but one we a sickly wife and eight children none of em factory age and i don't take up his cause only though he's a poor good for naught as can only manage two looms at a time but i take up the cause of justice why are we to have less wage now i ask than two year ago don't ask me said margaret i'm very ignorant ask some of your masters surely they will give you a reason for it it's not merely an arbitrary decision of theirs come to without reason you're just a foreigner and nothing more he said contemptuously but you'll know about it ask the masters they'd tell us to mind our own business and they'd mind theirs our business being you understand to take the baited wage and be thankful and their business to bait us down to clemen point to swell their profits that's what it is but said margaret determined not to give way although she saw she was irritating him the state of trade may be such as not to enable them to give you the same remuneration state of trade that's just a piece of master's humbug it's rate of wages i was talking of the masters keep the state of trade in their own hands and just walk it forward like a black bugaboo to frighten naughty children with into being good i tell you it's their part their cue as some folks call it to beat us down to swell their fortunes and it's ours to stand up and fight hard not for ourselves alone but for them round about us for justice and fair play we help to make their profits and we ought to help spend em 
it's not that we want their brass so much this time as we've done many a time afore we'n getting money laid by and we're resolved to stand and fall together not a man on us will go in for less wage than the union says is our due so i say hooray for the strike and let thornton and slickson and hamper and their set look to it thornton said margaret mr thornton of marlborough street ay thornton of marlborough mill as we call him he is one of the masters you are striving with is he not what sort of a master is he do you ever see a bulldog set a bulldog on hind legs and dress him up in coat and breeches and yon just gettin john thornton nay said margaret laughing i deny that mr thornton is plain enough but he's not like a bulldog with its short broad nose and snarling upper lip no not in look i grant you but let john thornton get a hold of a notion and he'll stick to it like a bulldog you might pull him away with a pitchfork ere he'd leave to go he's worth fighting with is john thornton as for slickson i take it some of these days he'll wheedle his men back with fair promises that they'll just get cheated out of as soon as they're in his power again he'll work his fines well out on em i'll warrant he's as slippery as an eel he is he's like a cat as sleek and cunning and fierce it'll never be an honest up and down fight with him as it will be with thornton thornton's as dour as a door-nail an obstinate chap every inch on him the old bulldog poor bessie said margaret turning round to her you sigh over it all you don't like struggling and fighting as your father does do you no she said heavily i'm sick on it i could have wished to have had other talk about me in my latter days than just the clashing and clanging and clattering that has wearied a my life long about work and wages and masters and hands and knobsticks poor wench latter days be fard thou'rt looking a slight better already for little stir and change beside i shall be a deal here to make it more lively for thee tobacco smoke chokes me she said querulously then i'll never smoke no more in the house he replied tenderly but why didst thou not tell me afore thou foolish wench she did not speak for a while and then so low that only margaret heard her i reckon he'll want a the comfort he can get out o either pipe or drink afore he's done her father went out of doors evidently to finish his pipe bessie said passionately now am i not a fool am i not miss there i knew i ought to keep father at home and away for the folk that are always ready to tempt a man in time of strike to go drink and there my tongue must needs quarrel with this pipe o hisn and he'll go off i know he will as often as he wants to smoke and nobody knows where it'll end i wish i'd let him myself be choked first but does your father drink asked margaret no not to say drink replied she still in the same wild excited tone but what win ye have there are days with you as with other folk i suppose when you get up and go through the hours just longin for a bit of change a bit of philip as it were i know i hae gone and bought a four-pounder out o another baker's shop to common on such days just because i sickened at the thought of going on for ever with the same sight in my eyes and the same sound in my ears and the same taste in my mouth and the same thought or no thought for that matter in my head day after day for ever i've longed for to be a man to go spreein even it were only to tramp to some new place in search of work and father all men have it stronger in em than me to get tired of sameness and work for ever and what is em to do it's little blame to them if they go to the gin shop for to make their blood flow quicker and more lively and to see things they never see at no other time pictures and looking-glass and such like but father never was a drunkard though maybe he's got worse for drink now and then only you see 
and now her voice took a mournful pleading tone at times a strike there's much to knock a man down for all they start so hopefully and where's the comfort to come fro he'll get angry and mad they all do and then they get tired out with being angry and mad and maybe had on things in their passion they'd be glad to forget bless your sweet pitiful face but you don't know what a strike is yet come bessie said margaret i won't say you're exaggerating because i don't know enough about it but perhaps as you're not well you're only looking on one side and there is another and brighter to be looked to it's all well enough for you to say who have lived in pleasant green places all your life long and never known want or care or wickedness either for that matter take care said margaret her cheek flushing and her eyes lightening how you judge bessie i shall go home to my mother who is so ill so ill bessie that there's no outlet but death for her out of the prison of her great suffering and yet i must speak cheerfully to my father who has no notion of her real state and to whom the knowledge must come gradually the only person the only one who could sympathize with me and help me whose presence could comfort my mother more than any other earthly thing is falsely accused would run the risk of death if he came to see his dying mother this i tell you only you bessie you must not mention it no other person in milton hardly any other person in england knows have i not care do i not know anxiety though i go about well dressed and have food enough oh bessie god is just and our lots are well portioned out by him although none but he knows the bitterness of our souls i ask your pardon replied bessie humbly sometimes when i've thought of my life and the little pleasure i've had in it i've believed that maybe i was one of those doomed to die by the falling of a star from heaven and the name of the star is called wormwood and the third part of the waters became wormwood and men died of the waters because they were made bitter one can bear pain and sorrow better if one thinks it has been prophesied long before for one somehow then it seems as if my pain was needed for the fulfilment other ways it seems all sent for nothing nay bessie think said margaret god does not willingly afflict don't dwell so much on the prophecies but read the clearer parts of the bible i dare say it would be wiser but where would i hear such grand words of promise hear tell it anything so far different for this dreary world and this town above a has in revelations many's the time i've repeated the verses in the seventh chapter to myself just for the sound it's as good as an organ and as different from every day too no i cannot give up revelations it gives me more comfort than any other book i the bible let me come and read you some of my favourite chapters ay she said greedily come father will maybe hear you he's devil with me talkin and he says it's all not to do with the things o' detay and that's his business where's your sister gone fusty and cutting i were loath to let her go but somehow we must live and the union can't afford us much now i must go you have done me good bessie i done you good yes i came here very sad and rather too apt to think my own cause for grief was the only one in the world and now i hear how you have had to bear for years and that makes me stronger bless you i thought a eh, the good doing was on the side of gentlefolk i shall get proud if i think i can do good to you you won't do it if you think about it but you'll only puzzle yourself if you do that's one comfort you're not like no one i ever seed i don't know what to make o you nor i of myself good-bye bessie stilled her rocking to gaze after her i wonder if there are many folk like her down south 
she's like a breath of country air somehow she freshens me up above a bit who'd have thought that face as bright and as strong as the angel i dream of could have known the sorrow she speaks on i wonder how she'll sin all of us must sin i think a deal on her for sure but father does the like i see and mary even it's not often who's stirred up to notice much End of chapter 17